All right, welcome everybody, and uh, and thanks for thanks for coming out here. Um, uh, you know, th uh, this has never been done before. We have this lineup. If, if, if a bomb dropped here, Amy Pascal would own Hollywood. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, this is such an interesting topic because we're, we're inundated each day with talk of awards and at this time of year, and it's really amazing. But I'm just curious, just to start it off, what were your first memories? Do you remember the very first Oscar show you ever saw? You know, or, or what what sparked it for you with with this, Harvey? Do you remember the first time you saw an Oscar show? I, I don't know, but I always was. I think probably Ben Hur. Yeah. Was, um, Fifty-nine. I nice, was rooting for it too, little kid, but watching it and uh, it was amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just uh, curious. This is such a competitive season. They say it's a wide open race. You know, and I'm wondering how the fact that it's anybody's ball game uh, encourages your readiness and willingness to uh, offer up a pricey campaign and really go for that, or do you always sort of look at the Oscars the same way each year in what what you're going to do? Um, can you take that, Tom? You know, because I know you guys have Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and uh, well, uh, yeah, we have. Uh, we have a, a lot of pictures uh, between the pictures at the studio unit and Searchlight has four or five pictures, but uh, I am a contrarian about this. I think that the whole nation, the uh, whole notion of race and spending, and I think it's hugely exaggerated. Um, I think that uh, voters know what they want to vote for once they've seen the movies. And our job is to get them to see the movies, uh, to advance positions for them to think about, but ultimately um, the Academy's going to decide. And we are a group of very uh, smart, and I happen to think, in contrast to what's often said, uh, forward thinking voters. So I know that the media likes to talk about campaigns and spending, but I ultimately think it comes down to the movies, as it should. That echo is really <laughs> tricky. Yeah. Well, just to play devil's advocate to that. Imagine my surprise. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years ago, um, Meryl Streep was up for Best Actress. I believe it was Julia, Julie, uh, Julian and Julie, and um, and it was uh, Sandra Bullock's year. And Sandra Bullock was out there, and she was very graceful about it. And it was obvious that Meryl Streep wanted no part of it. She did, she wasn't, she really, um, I thought, I thought that Sandra Bullock's candidacy was greatly benefited by the fact that she was out there. And that Meryl Streep, if you don't campaign, and I see Woody Allen do it all the time, you really hurt, you really hurt your chances. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I guess there's some truth to it. Um, but I suppose it depends what you mean by campaign. Now, when you, when you, uh, uh, Academy Awards are, we know this over many years, are uh, sometimes get a momentum for the particular performance. Sometimes they get a momentum for the length of the career and, um, and all the work that's been done. You can look back, uh, look recently at at, uh, at uh, Paul Newman and the eight times he was nominated, and the one time he won, you might not say was the best performance of those seven or eight other times. So uh, I think there are lots of factors that 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 go into it, and I don't really think being on the stump, so to speak, is ultimately when in the privacy of their voting booth, in their living room, um, people tick the box. I, I call me, call me a sap, but I think they vote on there. Sap. <laughs> I don't think that's your peers. Yeah. I'd say Mr. Weinstein proves him wrong every year. <laughs> okay, Harvey, that, that's a that's a, a call to arms here. Um, what about it? Do you think though that, that campaigning, for lack of a better word, gets people to see the movies? You've got to bring it in front of them, you know, in one way or another. That's the only thing that counts. And so Tom and I actually agree to more than you think. It's just 
maybe the methodology. Now you have just witnessed an historic. <laughs> I'm going to host Fox at the movies tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, um, I think that just the, the only thing you can do, I've said this a thousand times, is get people to see your movie. If they don't see your movie, they can't vote, and, if they, and they won't vote with this group. So that's the biggest thing. And you know what? There's so many movies, and I bet you everybody on this panel hasn't seen every movie, and it's hard to get your attention right now. So yes, I, I agree with that, and that's basically the point I'm making. Um, and I think that it's gotten um, harder too to have the movies seen in the best environment in which to see those. Um, obviously, we all do screeners and all the, the movies. In in honesty, you know, Planet of the Apes is not as good in the screener as it is on the on a big screen. I'm sure that you go seen at home on the screener is not as good. I'm sure that you know the uh, movie I absolutely. Uh, adore Harry Potter, which I thought was a fantastic experience, but you consume that in a big theater on a big screen and also in its time. The other thing that I think is hard is the um, uh, crush of films that all come in at the end and when you're trying to you know, be responsible, see all the movies, you're seeing them sometimes multiple ones and it's just not the best environment. So. I have to agree with Harvey completely. I think the thing to do is to get people to see your films in a, in a space where they're able to see them. I mean, a movie like The Descendants, it's a beautiful, humanistic film about, you know, conflicting emotions. And you need to see that film in a place, in a time when you're able to absorb it and really think about it. So it's not just getting them to see it, but I think how you get them to see it, too. Jeffrey, you have two uh, animated uh, films uh, in contention this year, Kung Fu Panda 2 and Puss in Boots. Is it, do you agree, is it very important to see those on the screen in 3D? Because we know you're a big proponent of that and the theater-going experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, and again, just to sort of cut to the chase on it, um, you know, we spend four years and $150 million trying to make an exceptional experience in a movie theater and use all the different uh, tools that we can put in the hands of our artists, one of which is 3D, and that is the optimal way to see the movie. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we settle for the fact that many, 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 many people will never see it that way, and, um, and that's a shame. Are we rushing the season, though, here, you know, and making it hard for people just to get out and see the films, and they've got piles of screeners, and there's even talk of moving the Academy Awards a month earlier and things? Yeah, I don't want to, but I, I don't think that's the problem when the Academy Awards are. Personally, I think it's a good thing to move up. I think the problem you're on to, though, is a very significant one. It's a problem, I believe, more for the business as a whole than just for uh, the awards themselves is that too many of a certain type of film are concentrated in too short a period of time. And yes, that is a function of the circle that gets formed between awards and press, press and promotion, etc. that crowds too many films into the last part of the year. Um, and I think there's no question that it would be healthier for the business overall and the films and the length of the run of the various films if they could be spread out more through the year. Well, do you think, I mean, is it best to get out early Oscar campaigning or is it better to wait, watch, and then be fresh in voters' minds? Okay, so Rob, you could really speak to this because you had a movie few people have heard of now called The Hurt Locker a couple of years ago and that actually opened in June. Right. Yeah, can you talk about how that managed to survive all of this and you know and then on the onslaught in the fall and Christmas and come back and actually win best picture well again I think uh, what everybody's saying is it's uh, it's vital to get the movies seen the fact that we came out in June and the fact that we had built uh, quite a reputation both critically and as far as uh, audience response uh, helped for uh, Academy voters to to sample the movie. Uh, Academy voters sadly don't get to watch all their movies, so going back to the campaign issue or the profile issue of Sandra Bullock, 
you know, making herself available for publicity and things like that. It's important for that momentum, especially when it comes time to put the titles in the box and you haven't seen them, but you understand it's popular, you understand the performance is great, so inevitably uh, boxes don't go empty. So, uh, you know, most Academy voters don't get a chance to see all of them. They, they have the opportunity, but maybe they just don't choose to or they, uh, they just don't have the time. So I think the campaigning and the profile, not necessarily the advertising, but the profile I think is important and the, and the reputation of film builds. Uh, we built, uh, had a long climb uh, to build the reputation for the Hurt Locker and, and uh, we believe that that helped the measure well, One question though, Rob. That by the time the Oscars came around, the Hurt Locker had pretty much gone through its revenue cycle. So here you are up against Avatar, which is a colossal, the biggest film ever. Um, you know, when did you decide, um, even if it wasn't necessarily in the financial best interests of your company, that you had to go for it in terms of, you know, spending aggressively to keep this in the minds of voters and make sure that uh, the film got a fair chance. By the way, I did offer Tom and Jim the opportunity to trade revenue for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we thought about it. You know. <laughs> Um, actually, we had uh, we had thankfully not completed our revenue cycle. We were not yet out on uh, on video and uh, VOD, etc. Uh, and the film performed uh, massively in those uh, revenue environments. Uh, the difference is, I think, uh, and when we when we bought the Hurt Locker and when we marketed the Hurt Locker, we knew that that any kind of uh, war themed, especially uh, Middle East Iraqi themed film, was challenged at best. Uh, at the box office. So it was important for us to try to make the film as available as we could and, and we gave the movie every opportunity to find you know, a very, very a wide audience across the country, but ultimately it sort of found its level in the theatrical universe, but ultimately uh, in, the, uh, in the home entertainment market it, uh, it, it performed enormously well. Tom, was that a big disappointment for you, 20th Century Fox, to, to lose the best picture with Avatar to the Hurt Locker, or did you just want to go back and count the money? <laughs> well, I guess uh, the technical uh, answer to that would be, fuck yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fuck yes that we were disappointed to lose. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think... Uh, Robbie and I found ourselves uh, waiting for our cars uh, uh, by the heater that night afterwards, and I congratulated him uh, mightily because I think the Hurt Locker's a wonderful film, um, and I think his company did a terrific, terrific job. But, you know, uh, I've made my career being uh, honest, and if I said I wasn't brutally disappointed, it would be an understatement. Um, I think it is, uh, it's not uncommon, right, uh, that that happens. David and Goliath is a very good uh, narrative. And, uh, you know, like anyone else, it's easy to root uh, for the little guy. So I understand that. Uh, I understand that emotionally. And I'm actually glad from business sense overall of the good that comes to the movie like The Hurt Locker because it was the year before, I think, that the searchlight we were fortunate enough to win was Slumdog Millionaire. So, you know, the Academy giveth and the Academy taketh away. <laughs> I will say, uh, uh, we had a good fortune last year with, with The Black Swan and The Best Actor. So, those things happen. But I, I do think there is one having a bully pulpit, I suppose, for two seconds, unless the voice of God S comes back here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I do think there is a little thing that it puts me in mind of to a degree, which is that, you know, sometimes I think the craftsmanship, the artistry that's involved in what is thought of as commercial Hollywood cinema is not given its proper place in the Academy. So in the end of the day, to decide that, that the Hurt Locker is the better ultimate picture of the year than Avatar, I can understand that. But when you look down categories of sound and things like that that happen 
uh, sometimes I think that that the other crafts that get swept along, I was surprised and I would say also disappointed that a lot of the crafts people that worked on that film for so long and so hard and had invented and originated and done things that had never been done before, uh, that those people were not uh, recognized. Well, you know, every year there are wildly popular franchises that to date don't, you know, didn't for some reason get nominated for the marquee Oscar categories. And I guess I would ask this down the line. Which of your films do you feel has been unfairly overlooked over the years? And is there a film now that you're concerned about that perhaps, uh, that perhaps should be, should be, should not be discounted in this year's race? I'm looking at you, Jeff, Harry Potter guy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think the quality of Harry Potter or the last eight pictures um, has been somewhat discounted. And to deliver the movie that we delivered with a final movie, the quality of that film, the storytelling, the visuals, it really does feel like it deserves a fair chance. If you look at the reviews that it received and look at the box office, which is considerable, um, it feels like the type of movie that traditionally would receive some Oscar you know, at attention. And for me also, there's what Chris Nolan's done with the Batman franchise. And um, you know, I think obviously Heath um, won an award um, posthumously. But I think what Chris has done, both with Batman and in a way with Inception, which was a very, you know, bold movie uh, for a studio to make, it's. I don't feel necessarily that the studios are rewarded for the risk taking that they do, um, particularly on the scale that that movie was made at and uh, the quality that it was delivered at. So I, I do think there is some bias against you know, Hollywood and the resources that it has and the scale that it delivers. And I think, you know, it's nice when a movie like, you know, Titanic actually gets the recognition, you know, that it deserves and delivers for being such a groundbreaking, risk-taking, innovative film. Stacey, I would be curious to know your take on this too, because you have two movies this year from DreamWorks, very different films. One that came out in the summer, The Help, which I think before it opened, you may not have been focusing totally on Oscars at that time. And now War Horse, big movie, end of the year, Steven Spielberg directed, you know, yet they're both important to you, but tell us the difference there. Well, you know, we, we do love both movies, and I think there's some similarities to both of them in the sense that what we really um, focus on primarily was, as the, as the panelists emphasized, getting audiences to see and love the movies. And so in the case of uh, The Help, we endeavored to, to create a very extensive word of mouth campaign all summer and to build awareness about the movie and build emotion around the movie. And um, you know, it was left to the audiences to, to remark upon the fact that these performances were extraordinary. Um, and in, in their acknowledgement and love and embrace of the movie, I think it's taken on um, uh, an awards-worthy patina. In the case of Stephen's movie, Workhorse, we really endeavor to do the same thing, which is to, to um, get audiences really to see the movie and to especially see it in its grandeur. It's a beautiful movie, and to see it on a big screen um, is a treat. And so he led us this time around to something that he's never done before, which was screen it widely to regular audiences and, and let them vote and let them experience it with their, with their hearts. Rob, do Oscars matter to Paramount? I mean, I know a lot of other things do. <laughs> well, I think what you find during this time of year is the movies that get this recognition tend to get a lot of attention, therefore get attention with filmgoers. And so one of the biggest pieces of this is as you start to acknowledge great work, there is so much information now that so many filmgoers and people in the industry have that movies that may not be easy to sell in 30 second TV spots that are about great performances or incredibly dynamic writing, that as you start to get attention from the Academy, that will then get people to say, that's a movie I should see. That it's easy when you have Transformers and Rise of the Apes and Harry Potter, when you have spectacular visuals and you've spent tens of millions of dollars on visual effects, it's easy to sell that in television. But when you have something like Young Adults, where it's a story about 
a girl going back to steal her married ex-boyfriend who just had a baby and he, she wants to get back with him. That's hard to say to somebody in 15 or 30 seconds, this is a movie for you. <laughs> it's hard to say that in two hours. <laughs> I have seen the movie, so I but when you then start to see the reviews and you start to have people experience the movie and the performances in that movie, then people start to see Charlize Theron and the amazing transformative performance she gives. Suddenly they're like, oh, that's a movie I should see that another time of year you might not get to. And at the end of the year when you do have people putting out top ten lists and you start to feel the movies that are going to get nominated or do get nominated, it really does then acknowledge great performances and great works that are much more about great filmmaking than necessarily that are movies that are spectacular. Harvey, you know, people call you the godfather of the modern Oscar campaign. Obviously, Oscars are very important to the kinds of films you release. And we saw the reel earlier today, and you know, most of the films, almost all of them that you have, have been released in the fall and are coming out now, and it's a sort of a strategy. So how important it is to the financial life for your movies, this whole awards process? Well, it's, it's hard to get an audience to see Coriolanus you know, without the uh, you know, acknowledgement of critics, you know, Academy voters, you know, guilds, et cetera. So it goes see, to Harvey's actually the smartest of everybody here, because what Harvey has done is actually the exact opposite of everything that we're talking about here. He uses the award season to market his movies. He uses all of these things that are going on, all of these panels, all of these screenings, all of this competition, and he makes money. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, we get to make some great movies. <laughs> and, and inspire other studios to finance other great movies <laughs> instead of some of the stuff that studios sometimes do. Here we go. Harry Potter is a seminal movie and a seminal franchise, so I want to speak to that because I think so many kids, my own included, read those books and then were incredibly entertained by the movie. So I'm going to agree with Jeff. I think that movie and the franchise itself is not getting the respect that it should, especially because I think an entire generation grew up, you know, on those films. And, so, and if you look today at the bestseller list, so many books are young adults. So if we're teaching our kids in, in a, I hate to say it, but reading is a lost art. It was Harry Potter that restored that lost art. And the last movie I know for my kids and me was a seminal experience in saying goodbye you know, to the franchise. And they were moved and they were crying and they were as moved as any artistic movie. And it was as good as any movie that's in competition this year. Now, I do think that quality is ultimately the key. And you know, to everybody's point here, you know, you have to see the movies for people to recognize it and understand it. Um, but there's a lot of big movies and a lot of big movies that come out of the studios that are really quality films and really risk-taking films. And you know, they're inspired in large part by the types of movies that Harvey makes, and they're also inspired by the studios real belief in filmmakers, real belief in quality, and real belief in, you know, the desire to put out interesting, exciting, different movies in front of people. Well, now, the earlier thing that Harvey said about studio films, Tom, I thought I saw your hand up. Uh, I was just going to say that I think that actually Jeffrey is as, uh, as uh, sharp as he always is, has uh, uh, put, put his finger on what is an essential Dy uh, dynamic that plays out here and difference. I don't think Harvey is alone in doing it. Uh, Searchlight is in its 17th year um, of, of doing exactly that. Um, Sony Classics, uh, Focus, etc. Uh, there are, there is a, uh, there is a split in the modern movie business. Um, and that, uh, that split it reduced, uh, I think, oversimplified, has more to do actually with the method of marketing the movies, often than the movies themselves. 
Uh, I happen to believe personally that an audience don't really either, they just don't care what a movie costs, they care how it makes them feel. Um, but they do respond to how it's presented to them. So movies like Harry Potter, Planet of the Apes, X-Men First Class, big, you know, uh, big traditional commercial movies that are made with a lot of quality that go out high, wide, and handsome with tens of millions of dollars of television advertising. That is one entire system of distribution, right? Um, and I think it's fair to say that probably the importance of awards to films like that is validation. And those things are important because the artists who work on the awards and the companies that finance them feel strongly about, you know? Then there's a whole other set of movies. Uh, Coriolanus, uh, uh, Shane, uh, movies that are win-win, uh, films that are challenging, that don't, as Rob said, submit easily to a 15 or a 30 second television spot. Um, those films need to be nurtured, they need to be distributed with, a, with true commitment and patience for the long haul. Uh, we have something now very fortunate happening with The Descendants, which is um, uh, unusual in that this is a film which even this weekend is only still on 800 screens, even though it's approaching its fourth week of distribution. It's number seven uh, in the films on a fraction of the screens that everybody else, it's over $20 million. It's hard not to try to push the button and jump to 3,000 screens in a movie like that. It's hard to nurture that film, to stay with it over the long haul, um, to support it over the long haul of the time that it takes for awareness and appreciation, particularly among an adult audience, to build. So for those kind of films, I agree with Harvey, Harvey completely that the <coughs> awards and the press and all of the various groups are essential to developing the kind of awareness that can't be, you know, just carpet bomb the way you can on big commercial pictures. So even though they're vying against each other in the same, you know, Academy Award season, their their uh, route to that end and the function of that for them is diametrically different. Well, just to go back. I, I, I agree. I mean, we've all had smaller movies that need that loving and and nurturing, but I do think that that little big independent studio paradigm is, is is a paradigm of the past. It doesn't mean at the end of the day that the movies that might need that extra nurturing are still necessarily the most deserving and that the studios can't also bring um, love to storytelling, attention to quality, and, and, and not be penalized for the fact that they are availing themselves of, of a um, perhaps an easier distribution. Uh, I agree with that completely, and Stacey is ever is far more articulate than I, I was. I just I agree with that 100 percent. All I was saying is that in in the in the in the life cycle of the picture that what the the value of the recognition is different. Just to go back a second to the release timing of, of some of these movies, you know, I think, Tom, what you guys did with Little Miss Sunshine or what happened with Gladiator, those are movies that came out very early in the year. They ran throughout the year. And I think it came down to the quality of the films that ultimately led to their success. Now, the challenge of how and when you remind people of these films as they come out so early is obviously a trickier issue. But you know, Little Miss Sunshine played all summer long. You know, Glad Aid was released early in the early in the summer. Yeah. So it sort of and won the Academy Award. So I do think at the end of the day, it really does come down to like a lot of different pieces. But quality is a very, very big piece of it. I agree. With I think interestingly, there's even a conflict because for often now for. Um, the searchlight and some of our more specialized picture from a pure playtime point of view, earlier in the year is better because it's less crowded. I also right? think it would make for a much better show. I mean, this has been my soapbox. I feel like it's really hard to expect the audience to be there for us for the award show itself when many small towns and many communities never get to see the movies. And it's like watching American Idol and, and tuning in for the finale. 
not having had the experience and an emotional engagement with the run-up to it. So I, I keep wishing that the Academy itself could figure out a way that for film lovers, we could create some kind of of, of opportunity for smaller communities to see movies that haven't yet made it to their towns. Um, Harvey, I wanted to ask you, you, you picked up The Artist. It's a black and white silent movie. Is there any way you would have considered that movie if, the, say, the Oscars didn't exist or some kind of promotional opportunity like that to help a, a specialty film like that, you know? I, I just thought the movie was great, you know? So I think greatness, you know, word quality, as the panelists said, stands out in any form, be it a small movie or a big movie. And um, so the answer is, I would have picked it out no matter what, because it's just so good. I mean, to be fair to Far Harvey, he's one of the remaining, I think, true cinephiles in the business. I think yes. everyone on this panel yeah. is. I think we're all capable of an irrational level. I don't agree. Right? I think we're. I don't, I don't <laughs> 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 I'm sitting next to him. That's what we say. We got a little something going here. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Here, yes. debate this idea, okay? <laughs> I think starting next year on uh, uh, whatever that Sunday is, Martin Luther King weekend, uh, January 14th, 15th, whatever it is, on that night should be the Golden Globes. The next night the WGA, the next night the DGA, the next night the PGA, all the way through the week. We put them all in a hat and just pick it out there and everybody gets their night. And on the next Sunday night is the Academy Awards and the entire award season will be nine days long. Where's your party? We'll do it here in this theater. We'll do it. <laughs> I would say that's the end of the season, but with that kind of timetable, they'll probably start in May, you know, with this thing, because it seems like it's more and more dragged out. I mean, this is like six months. You start with the fall festivals. Do you think award season's too long? I know that was kind of like a fun statement, but is it too long? Well, yes. The answer is for, for sure. Now, in fairness, there are movies, we've talked about this, that actually have, it's a huge benefit to them because it is literally that process that allows a film like The Artist, which is an extraordinary film, and it needs that time, it needs that nurturing. And the extension of these four months is in fact what will allow that film to be seen. And what I suggested will eliminate that part of the process, and I'm sure Harvey would say for not all of his films, but for many of his films, this actually would not be the best uh, process for that. On the other hand, um, the thing for me, I, you know, you asked, do we have memorable moments? I said, you know, about the Academy, I don't know that I have a memorable moment. What I do know is when I arrived here, when I was 24 years old from New York, I very much uh, remember that the single most aspirational thing as a young PA starting in the movie business is if someday you could have any association with something worthy of the Academy Award. It was literally the gold standard. That's it. That's the gold ring of what accomplishment would be about as somebody starting in the movie business. And the thing I worry about is for the next generations, that's not going to be the case because by the time we get to the Academy Awards now, it feels like, to a very large extent, it's anticlimactic. You know, how many times is an actress going to stand up there and accept uh, an award? By the time you get to the Academy Award, almost every year now for the last five years, they've already accepted it two or three times, if not four or five, on national television. It's, it's just, it's lost. It's patina. And for me, I, I find that deeply disturbing. Well, we have a lot of Academy members here today, and do you think that the Academy members are actually influenced by all these playoff games that we now have with these different awards? I'm, I'm not even questioning whether they're influenced or not about it, Pete. I'm simply saying for the Academy Awards, which is the gold standard, it is 6,000 professional people who know more about judging or qualifying or looking at, you know, what is uh, the best of the best of that year. Uh, that's, that's, that is the final and, and ultimately uh, the most valued uh, judgment. 
to put it at the end of the process the way it is now, after so many other things occur before it, I think has diminished it. And to me, for a kid, when I came to California, I don't believe for my son it holds the same for him today as it did for me. Harvey, what do you think about that? Because as they said, as Jeffrey said, you, you've been the you've been the one who uses it actually to find audiences for your films and to you know and to gain box office. What do you think about that? Uh, I'll tell you my most memorable uh, moment at the Academy Awards, and maybe not my most memorable, but one of the seminal moments for me was the first time I went to the Academy Awards it was for Rain Man, and I remember it won, and I, I knew Mark Johnson peripherally. And I left, you know, the Academy Awards, and it, and I saw Mark Johnson waiting for his car, and it took two hours for Mark Johnson's car after he won the Oscar <laughs> for the Best Picture, and two and a half hours for our car. And I just remember saying, "What a leveler!" At the end of the day, the guy just says thank you in front of a billion people, and his car takes two hours to come out. <laughs> and it's kind of like the experience we all have. We've all had great success on this panel. But Arvin, and, and then, hang on a second. And then the next day, we probably have to like say to Justin Bieber, hey, would you like to read this script? <laughs> <laughs> so, but Harvey, so I think that's the love. I do want to ask you a question, though, I, because I, I know you, and I, I am certain that this is, case, this is the case. How much did you want to touch that Academy Award when you were standing next to Mark Johnson? Just not at all. For a moment. It's the symbol of it. It's not the award itself. Oh, very nice. I, I, I agree with Jeffrey. Um, I think we need to try to guard against the diminishment of what it means. Uh, I think I'm on record, I'll say it again, although it's a losing fight. I think even though it is to the disservice of a company like ours, which participates in many, many different areas of filmmaking, and in a year like this has you know, maybe half a dozen films that could be considered hopefuls. I think it was a big mistake to have increased the number of best picture slots from five to ten, uh, or whatever the cockamamie thing, I'm not here to figure this out, in the middle or however in between it is, whether the over or the under, or what the Vegas odds are, but the, that, for the same reasons that Jeffrey you know, it used to meet live, live from the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. That's my first memory. And um, just there were five best films. And let me tell you, it hurt like hell years ago. When are you telling me now in retrospect that Castaway um, uh, wasn't one of the five best films of that year? It's one of the top on my list that I ever worked on, but it didn't make it, right? It, those, that was valuable precisely because it was rare, precisely because it was hard, precisely because sometimes injustice happened. So I wish, uh, I wish we could go back to that. Yeah. I wish it could go back to being incredibly valuable. I also think that would help to distinguish it from all of the other many of the other award ceremonies that come before, which was it was small, it was harder. You know, lots of them have 10, and the National Board of Review, and the a a a a F uh, I has 10, and the thing, it's like, I, I agree with Jeremy, it's meant to be rare, and the, and the highest of the high, and the most enduring thing. And I think we should stop worrying about the ratings and start worrying about what the awards mean. It's actually not just about the ratings, and it's not about the ratings. It's about movies that, uh, like uh, Batman, that uh, missed the cut as well, and uh, that everyone uh, film was from a quality perspective, uh, not just an entertainment perspective, an extraordinary film. And uh, it didn't have the opportunity to be one of the selected. Well, but Robbie, that's so, because there's also, there's also actually structurally a different <laughs> methodology in the way the votes are counted, so that the votes are actually much more meaningful amongst the, the voters than they used to be. In the old days, a movie could be voted by 21% of the Academy and be the best picture. 
Yeah, just to be Tom's contrarian for a second, you know, I think what the 10 pictures actually does allow you to do is broaden the genre and style of film that's considered. By the so, way, this year, yes, it's, yes, it's confusing. Yes, may, in fact, it maybe it diminishes the value, but it does also allow a movie like The Dark Knight entry into a category where, you know, from my point of view, it belonged. And it's not necessarily 10 now. It's a, there's a, a different structure that can allow for it. Yeah, it's a new structure, in case you don't know, where it's now, it, you can have five or 10 nominees or any number in between because it's based on your first place votes. It's your passion votes they're trying to get. So I think it's something like 250 to 300 first place votes will get you an automatic nomination. And that could go up to 10 nominees or it could bring us right back down to five. Do you think that's a good thing, um, it going in this direction then, you know? No. <laughs> well, I think, as I Jeff said, I think that should be five, and I think it stinks when the Dark Knight doesn't get voted, but not enough people thought it was one of the five best. But that's why it's tough. It's tough strokes. But that's why it's rare. That's why when you said it was nominated for Best Picture, it was something superlative. You don't diminish superlatives, you protect them. But if you have a movie like Toy Story and, and an animation category isn't allowed in and isn't considered, and you could argue it's some of the greatest storytelling ever, I think by broadening that number of pictures, it allows for a broadening of a number of great stories. Okay, do you think it d diminishes the value of the Best Picture nomination financially? So you can advertise Best Picture nominee? Do you think it makes a difference if there's 10 nominees or five? No, I think, but again, the consumer has so much information now, right? I mean, the world is very different than it was 15 years ago. So this really is about identifying what are the best movies. And in a year, there may be 10 great movies. In a year, there may be six great movies. but. The consumer will now hear about what those great movies are. And I don't think they're sitting at home going, oh, there's eight, I'm not interested. But ultimately, they're going to then seek those movies out and seek to talk about them and watch them. And that's ultimately what the goal for a lot of us is. Now, that becomes the question of what is the goal. And I think for us, the goal is getting people to see great movies. Mike? Uh, the new technology allows Academy members to see films on smaller and smaller screens. Is that fair to the filmmakers? Is it a major problem? I don't think any one of us like it. I mean, I think that all of us want and, you know, to our films to be seen, you know, on a big screen in a theater with people. So, um, you know, it's it's not ideal. Yeah, I think it. I think, in honesty, it's harder on certain films than others. So we're trying to do something this year, which may be jousting at windmills, but that's what we do. Uh, it's kind of when it's fun, is to try to get people to understand what's really involved in modern motion capture um, by trying to get people to see any circus's performance and to understand that performance. And as the lead in Planet of the Apes, the first time a sentient animal is actually the lead in, in the film and carries the emotion of that film, right? Well, and then what's great about that performance is the emotional nuance of it. It's tough on the little screen. It just isn't as impactful as it is on a, on a big screen. Now, the, the flip is also true. I think that um, emotionally uh, driven character-based stories like like a win-win a, a or, or a young adult, which I understand is terrific, but I'm seeing yet things that are less dependent on the, on the, on the, um, I guess the, uh, 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 the, the uh, production impact of it. Maybe it doesn't matter as much, but I think that for certain films, not seeing them as they were meant to be seen, we I I, we agree. Though, because it it. it it then does make the distinction in a movie, for example, like The Descendants, you don't want people to perceive it as, as less than, you know, or, or something that's suitable for a television movie. You want people to see it. I know how I feel when I get my screeners is, you know, guilt <laughs> that, that I'm not seeing it in the way it's supposed to be seen and that I could unfairly view something as, you know, less than or, 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 or 
suitable more for, for, for a TV size screen than for the big epic, you know. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think what Jeffrey said earlier, you know, his his company has done such fantastic work in 3D and you know, we have a, a picture we're very proud of, Rio, uh, which is really a visual extravaganza and a musical that is was as Jeffrey's pictures are now. This was created in 3D. It was designed in 3D. Uh, it's meant to be experienced in 3D. Um, Rio is, you know, it's great and it's fun uh, on a video cassette, but it is not the full experience that it is. Yeah. For me, like when I think of a movie like War Horse, where Stephen is bringing um, just, you know, the kind of rugged attitude toward filmmaking, where it's this grand landscape and really just the camera and his vision. No, no tricks, no gimmicks, no conceit. It's literally, you know, except for anything that might for a minute have harmed the horse. That, those were the only special effect shots. We could end up with a horse against an ape this year. Brilliant <laughs> 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 really delivers a great performance. Not to take anything away from Andy, who I thought was amazing. I, I mean, the, the truth is, is we make the decision to send the screeners out. The Academy does not yeah. send them out. So uh, it's ultimately our choice whether or not we want to make the determination that having it seen, as opposed to having it seen in the proper environment, is the ultimate yeah. uh, end game. So, I mean, we all believe, and uh, even the smallest of our, we have a very, very small, wonderful film, A Better Life, which the filmmaker would say, oh, you must see it in, this, in, in the theater. I mean, they spend, you know, all, all of the technical people and the, the, the crafts people and the artists spend, you know, their lives trying to make these films wonderful and beautiful and sound great. And, and but and ultimately they would choose to have you see it in a theater as well, even though it's a much smaller, more intimate story. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about getting people to see it as voters. And, and I have seen it, and it's wonderful. And I strongly recommend that anyone who hasn't see it. Yes, and, and I actually, I actually kind of get a chance to meet the star and the director of that. I, I do think it's you know, and I include all of us in this. It's, you know, we do make these films available for the Academy to see on screens. You know, we set timings, we provide bus transportation. <laughs> it's not impossible, just because you have a screener, to not experience the movie uh, in theater the way that it's meant to be seen. And, you know, I'm as guilty as the Academy member who doesn't do it. Um, but, uh, you know, it is made available and, you know, certainly people can see it that way if they want to see it, for even those movies that aren't in theater at the time. Well, you know, when you look over your year, how important is it in terms of you evaluating your year to actually have a viable Best Picture candidate? Well, uh, I'll go back to it just for a moment. The Best Picture candidate again goes back to what Jeffrey was saying about the marketing, the marketing element. I mean, uh, we have another movie that we love and we think is, is deserving. And we think it's deserving of being seen, and we believe that means to an end is to get a recognition called 50-50. It's a movie about surviving cancer, which most people don't want to go see that movie because they believe the subject matter is something that's uh, is not going to be something that they can uh, you know, be entertained by. So if you get recognition, if you get attention, whether it be critical or awards, it tends to at least, as we said, it, you know, it puts it in people's minds and it becomes possibly a selection that they make towards the end of the year when they want to, and, and it's people do want to see the movies that are going to be on the Academy Awards, that's the good news, they do want to see the awards season movies, it's one of the reasons why we all do this is because we want them to see the movies. Uh, would we like the awards? Sure. Mike the mic. Uh, let, when you look at the you know the end of the year and let's say you got skunked, no nominations, what are you thinking? I don't know. I think it's how you do, you know, hopefully economically as well as, you know, artistically. But you know, when I hear Rob talk about fifty fifty, I, I agree that that's a great movie. And but that's exactly what the Academy will do is reward that, you know, in some way, you know, um, and bring it to the attention of people, you know, to see that. That's what those seal of approvals do. So, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, I, I mean, I, you know, maybe there's other structures to consider, you know, 
the HFPA has the comedy thing. You know, I mean, maybe that helps the five movies get chosen to <laughs> take comedy out, and maybe it also rewards you know the comedy in a good way too. So I think you know, as the academy innovates, there might be other ways to innovate and all get everybody's point across. Because I think if there are five comedies, there's no way that The Dark Knight is in one of the five movies. So maybe that's a way of everybody getting what they want. But the Academy Award being out there, I think, I can speak for myself, is, is, is an absolute and ultimate goal. It's something that you're striving toward. And even if you are, you know, reach at times exceeds your grasp, you're striving for excellence. You're trying to bring the very best to the process. And when I hear of companies that say it's not part of their strategy or that they don't care about it, they just care about making money, I just feel like what happens to an organization is that you're saying that excellence is off the table in any genre, even for commercial movies. And then you, you know, then you get what you pay for, you get mediocrity. Yeah, for us, every time we've gone out to try to make an Academy movie, we failed. Well, I'm not saying that that's <laughs> right. goal. And but I agree with you that you have to be open to the surprises, but at least if you say that that is the pinnacle and that it's valuable and it's something to strive toward, it lifts up the quality of, 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 of all your projects. No, I agree. You have to be passionate about the movies that you make, and you have to strive for the greatest quality. And hopefully that will uh, result in some recognition. I, I thought what you just said was interesting. Can you really like take a blueprint and create what you think is an Academy movie? And would it ever work? Probably not. Harvey can. I can. I <laughs> is there an Academy movie? Is there something that defines these 6,000 disparate members and what they go for? No. Well, just, I mean, it does go back to quality. Just quality and, and remember, awareness. You have multiple branches. Uh, with multiple, uh, you know, artistry, they they view film in different ways and they gauge their excellence in different ways, and then it's a obviously an accumulation of all of those votes and all of those different approaches to the way they view film that determines the ultimate best picture nominees and ultimately the best picture. I think this year should be a surprising year because uh, is do you guys see a front runner this year? <laughs> Are you having a fun time this year because of that? Because, I mean, it really does seem to be wide open. There's one movie sort of left to come in. It's your movie, Jeff, uh, extremely loud and incredibly close. Okay, maybe it's already come in. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> just, just, we just finished the one of those. So one left. I mean, almost is there a disadvantage coming in so late, you know, and trying to get everybody to see it at the, you know, last minute? Yeah, I think we're disadvantaged a little bit by that. You know, we missed the National Border Review, and there are a couple other things that we missed. Um, but, you know, counting on a great film and counting on great word of mouth and uh, counting on everybody here seeing it. Was that a bad move on the part of the uh, New York film critics to move their thing up two weeks and the National Board of Review obviously missing that, but you weren't rushing the film out to please a bunch of critics and win some year in awards, you're doing it for the film? Or? We had to do what was best for the film at the end of the day, and we had to show what we felt was the best film and be respectful of the filmmakers involved. Uh, I got one last question for all of you here. And uh, it's, why are you going to win the best picture? <laughs> and I will start with Harvey, because I know he's rehearsed this problem. <laughs> why are you going to win the best picture this year? Harvey's the reigning champ, by the way. The King's Speech won last year for the Weinstein Company, the first best picture for the Weinstein Company. Um, there's no answer to that, so, um, you know, I can't answer it. You know, I, I just will say that um, it's good to be reminded on, on this panel of how good Rise of the Planet of the Apes was. I sent um, Rupert a letter, I think, the first, like, day, you go, you know, Harry Potter, there's so many great movies, you know, um, uh, I saw Tintin, I got War Horse in the, in the mail, and I won't watch it now. On the DVD, because of what Stacy said today. Uh, no, but seriously, looking forward to it. And people I know who have seen it said it's like um, it's a Steven Spielberg movie, but it's a throwback to my favorite filmmaker, John Ford. So I'm really excited now to see that on a big screen, and I won't watch my DVD. So it, I can't answer that question, but I can say that I think it was a great year for movies, and a lot of the movies on this panel that people make, you know, will show up, you know, in in the Academy. Yeah, and Jeff, why, why, maybe I'll say, why should 
you win the best picture. And is it hard to separate your kids here, you know, and to pick one over the, over the other? I mean, you as an Academy member are going to vote for one of them. Um, I, can, I can't predict. It's, you know, I, each year whether we actually have a, a candidate or not, I, I'm never right. I always lose a pool. So <laughs> it'd be difficult for me to say, you know, I, I obviously have a lot of, um, you know, care and uh, commitment and, and to all the movies that we make. Um, but Harry Potter is a unique film, and, and from a sentimental, emotional point of view, I think. This, again, the standard, the quality, the length of time, the 10-year period, I think it does deserve a certain recognition. Um, but that's not to say that it's going to win, it's just, it's the one that I, I would say I find emotionally uh, most connected to. Rob, for you, you know, you have like seven or eight movies you guys are campaigning for. <laughs> Well, we have some amazing filmmakers we are in business with this year, and a number of those films coming out, um, you know, Steven Spielberg actually has got two movies coming out at Christmas, one in animation, one live action. Um, and so with him doing Tintin, and so you have, you know, people who have been incredibly successful in live action film now doing animated movies, it's certainly also really expanding that. Um, segments, when you look at Gore Verbinski and Rango and Steven Spielberg and Tintin, it's very exciting when you see filmmakers that talented take on the animation medium. And then you have Marty Scorsese taking on 3D. Um, and so when you get back to the question about screeners, that's a movie where you have one of the best filmmakers taking on a new technology and do something spectacular with it. Um, again, it's a movie you're very excited to be part of and hope that people will see and hope that people will see it in 3D. Jeffrey, I'm going to slightly phrase it a little differently, but you won um, the very first animated feature uh, Oscar with Shrek. And why are you going to win this year? Because Pixar won it the last four years in a row, and it seems to be an open, open field here. Well, as we all, you're going to hear, you're going to get the same answer from everybody, unfortunately, Pete, which is, is that, you know, there's no predicting it, um, that, you know, we're proud of our movies, as everybody up here is. We will, each and every one of us, uh, here as executives support those movies and ultimately it is the Academy members that are going to you know decide and uh, no matter how much wishing and praying uh, and foot stomping we do um, you know there is no predicting them and so uh, I, I can't uh, I can't say to you that we are we're going to do anything other than uh, uh, hopefully uh, show up and be a part of it and for you, Stacy, basically, what does it mean? Well, I, I mean, I, we're, we're all, we all made a tacit, without even an agreement, that we weren't going gonna to go there in terms of just why each one of our individual films is deserving. But I can at least say what moves me and what motivates me, and it's just personal. But I always feel um, that movies that um, illuminate the human condition that are in some ways uplifting in, the, in, in revealing who we are, is always what moves me when you know I, I find that I'm the most moved when I make movies about that or see movies about that and that usually is what compels me to tick the box but that's a purely personal choice. Tom, I'm going to change it again. What would make you feel best about this award season once it ends, once we're at the end of February? When Albert and the Chipmunks is nominated. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, my mother. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> That's good. My mother had four children. And if you ask any one of those four children, they will all tell you, yeah, she loved both of them, but really I'm her favorite. <laughs> um, and she was fantastic. And I tried to do the same thing to make all of my children, to treat them all as if they were the favorite. So, we, we, <laughs> not to treat them equally, to treat them all, but they're the favorite. And I go back to what Stacy said a little while ago in answer to, to uh, another question, which is, when I come to the end of a year like this, um, and I think about Fox and 75 years, it's our 75th anniversary last year, and I see that we have pictures that whether they make it over the line or not, 
we shall see, but that are worthy of consideration in so many different areas for so many different audiences. Then, then I, I do, I, I look at it the way Stacy does. I think that then we've done a good job for a year. We've put out a lot of quality cinema. We've got a chance for those movies to endure. And the way I look at my job, which, you know, I'm just get from all the more lucky as hell, and I feel privileged to be, for some period of time, a custodian of that legacy that's gone on for 20th Century Fox for so long. And if you're adding to that legacy over the long haul by making pictures that are worthy, then I think you're doing a good job. And then the last thing I would say, which you didn't ask, but I'm compelled to say, <laughs> which is that I think the people up here are really a group of terrific executives um, who all care greatly about their own films and we compete hard with each other, very hard. But Rob and I shook hands after the uh, uh, Academy Award uh, result <laughs> uh, two years ago. And, and I think what there is and what you've seen on this panel is a great deal of respect and I think it makes me think the movie business is in pretty good hands. So, Tommy, I want to thank you for that. I do want to call a technical here because um, you're actually not supposed to be invoking uh, your mom or your dad until after the nominations. That's when Miriam and Max get rolled out. <laughs> Here's the thing, as it's been my whole career I've chased Harvey, and I'm still learning from the master. <laughs> Tom, Tom I, I could have told you why we were both going to lose that night. I had, I had Inglorious Bastards and you had Avatar, when both directors are in love with the same woman, and she happens to be the director. <laughs> you know you're going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> All right, Rob, you get the uh, last word. I'm not sure I can follow any of that. Actually, Tom and I won a, an Academy Award for Titanic, which was, uh, which was very nice. So uh, we, we were competitors and we were colleagues and, and continue to be so uh, us here together. Um, he literally did steal my line. I was going to say that all our children are, that are beautiful and intelligent. And, um, and uh, it's sort of the way that uh, I approach uh, my business perspective, uh, whether it's Oscar, whether it's you know attention, whether it's love and affection, um, you know they are all your children, and you want them all to succeed. So I, I, I think that that's uh, the way that we approach what we do for a living. And um, uh, just going back to to the season, I, I think one of the great uh, uh, things about the Oscar race, by and large, is that. It does have surprises, and surprises make it entertaining, and surprises make it fun, um, and it makes us nervous, and it makes us angry, and it makes us happy, and those are all emotions that we try to deliver in film, so it's nice to actually experience them, too, so. Uh, well said. And, um, before we go, I just want to remind you, we have the presentation. First summit, you're going to meet the star of A Better Life and the director, as well as uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and the uh, creatives behind 5050, and then we have uh, DreamWorks with Warhorse and the help. So, so those would be great to stay for those. And I want to thank all of you. It is so great hearing you talk about quality. Congratulations.